like to welcome Chef Neil Perry. Where do you start? I mean, such a journey you've had. You're an incredible person, inspirational. What got you into the industry? Uh, really, really luck in my parents. Um, Dad was an amazing influence on me as a cook. Uh, Mum, amazing influence on me as the sort of hospitality that I want to give in my restaurants. So he was a, a butcher by trade, uh, had butcher shops, loved fishing. So all of our holidays and, and, and weekdays, didn't matter when, if he could get out on the water and fish, um, he was fishing. So everything that we ate pretty much as a kid was beautiful and fresh. And, he, and we had a small garden. So we were kind of cooking with the seasons and, and uh, I kind of was doing that without actually realising it. And it wasn't until a lot later that I started to write my first book that I realised what an amazing influence he had been on me. But I just did the kind of thing of uh, 18, left, left school, took a gap year, got a job in a, in a uh, the Australia club actually as a waiter and, uh, and decided I wanted to make lots of money, go travelling overseas <laughs> and, and you know, spend my gap year in Europe. So uh, I think a couple of weeks in, into the restaurant uh, and, and I really got bitten by the hospitality bug and as it continued to unwind I got more and more into it, spent best part of six and a half years front of house managing restaurants and learning about uh, how to run them and the costs and doing the wages and buying wine and doing all that and then uh, you know again fell into the kitchen at about 25 and didn't, didn't, didn't really change then. So, so 25 was your first sort of cooking job? Yeah. And wh where was that? That was, uh, I sort of started because it, I was at sales at McMahon's Point yep. as a manager. Yep. I went over uh, to work at Rose Bay with them and I was on the floor. And the chef, this is my whole life is kind of sort of serendipity. It sort of, you know, something happens and it causes a a, a change or a rift in which way I'm going. One door so closes, one, one door, door closes, opens. one door opens. And, and uh, you know, so the, I loved cooking and I used to do all these ridiculous uh, dinner parties, which I tell people not to do now because <laughs> you spend all your time in the <coughs> kitchen, but cooking out of Michel Girard and, and uh, you know, all those sorts of books. And, and so uh, basically the, the chef jumped out of a, an aeroplane because he loved, he loved skydiving and he missed his landing and jarred his back so he was out for three weeks. Right. And I'd always call the pass on busy services from the other side anyway. So I kind of jumped in. It was a very simple menu. You're kind of grilling fish under salamander and stuff. And, and so I was running the pass, did a big Sunday lunch and, it was, and, it, and I just kind of straight away knew, wow, I love this. I don't have to deal with customers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't like that. No, <laughs> no, no I thought I loved this. Um, and then like Danielle, I'd been a, a, a customer in a lot of great restaurants in Sydney, making good money, spending good money, drinking good wine. And so my first port of call was to go and see um, Damien and Josephine Pinulay and sit down with Damien and say, Damien, I really want to cook. And wh what where should was I do? Wh this was at Claude's, Claude's, when we originally had Claude's uh, in Oxford restaurant. Street. Yeah. yeah, and I sat down and said, I really want to learn to cook. What should I do? And he said, well, you should read Escoffier, everything Jane Grigson's written, everything Elizabeth David's written, uh, all these other books that he, he sort of rattled off. Um, I went away and you know, I got a phone call and he said, and actually, come and work with us on Wednesdays. And that actually turned into every day. Right. Um, and then I spent three months there and then Stephanie Alexander was great friends with Damien. She offered me a job in Melbourne right around the time when Yanni came to Sydney. I kind of filled in a spot until someone from France came, came out. Uh, and then I went and worked at Jenny Ferguson's You and Me for three months and that was fantastic. Met Stefano Manfredi there. And then uh, I went and worked at the Bayswater Brasserie when Tony Pappas wow, opened yeah, it. Yeah. And that was insane because I'd gone from cooking in little restaurants. It was a bit more like sales really. The first day like 350 covers came the first night. And uh, you know, I didn't really know a lot about cooking but I probably <laughs> knew, knew, knew more than the other five people that were standing next to Tony and I. Yeah. So that was pretty crazy. And then I got offered uh, a job through an old girlfriend who knew Michael and Judy McMahon. Right. And I got and on Cat a, Catalina yeah, then? Was that? No, no, he, he, he had Baron Joey House. Yeah. It was 1982. Yeah. So I'm really old, by the way. <laughs> so it was 1982, and uh, I rode my motorbike up, sat on the lawn with Michael, drank a couple of bottles of Riesling. You should never let me get on the, back on the bike. Um, Judy came out and we had bread and but, uh, bread and, and, and cheese. And, you know, we just spent three hours together. And he read my resume 
I just think, and I'd been at Barara for a while, but I think what he didn't realise, uh, and it was uh, there for six months, there for three months, six weeks, there for three weeks, there for you know, three months. So over that year, I'd worked in really great restaurants, and he just said, yeah, will you come and be the chef? Right. So, 82, I was uh, at Barangay House cooking, um, you so, know, so, learning. So just before that, learning. so you, you'd moved around quite a lot. Yeah. Do you recommend that now? I mean, you obviously... No. <laughs> <laughs> no I mean, no. You, you obviously learn a lot. I, I, it was easier for me, uh, when I say easier, I came from a background of cooking a lot of at home and yeah. really understanding seasonality, ingredients, and when people were talking to me, and I'd run restaurants, so I'd bought this stuff, I'd been going to the fish markets, uh, at sales and buying the fish, I've been buying the wine, doing wine tastings. You know, back then there was eight francs to the dollar and no import duty, so we were drinking the best French wine as cheaply as what we were. You know, we were drinking Latache and Richebourg and things that you can't even Think imagine of, yeah. buying now. So, so when I walked into that environment, I'd run restaurants, run staff, run people, organise things. And so when I came in, and this is one thing I would say to young people. When I spent that six weeks or that three months with Stephanie, all I did was just work. I picked up every extra shift. I did whatever, whatever I could do. I was just there to learn everything I possibly could. I didn't, I didn't waste one minute mm. because I really wanted to gleam as much as I possibly could of out of that short period of time that I was going to be there. And I was 25, so I couldn't muck around. I wasn't 16. Yeah. It's a great thing that you've done to get where you've got. Did yeah. you ever expect that when you first started out? No, look, I mean, you know, everything's happened to me very organically. Yeah. Um, so I, I sort of started with one restaurant. I didn't expect that I'd have... Multiple. Multiple, yeah. Yeah. you know. And I didn't expect it once I sold out of Rockpool that I'd actually be very comfortable leaving that business and starting another one at my age. But How long did you have Rockpool? That group uh, we started in uh, 1989. Right. So, you know, and then um, the Bar and Grill started opening in 2006 and Spice Temples 2008. And so we kept on growing at Rosetta 2010. So, you know, that was just a, a sort of steady growth. But we learnt a lot in the 90s. I grew in the 90s and, and had a few failures and it was really... You know, if, if, when you hear the term location, location, location in restaurants, it's the three most important things, believe it. Uh, because I got to a point at one stage where I thought, oh, if I just bring great food and service and, you know, desi <laughs> design, it'll all be really good. But no, get those first three things right and then work really hard and then you've got an opportunity of, of, of really, you know, kicking a goal. So, so just on that, you've had an incredible career and, yeah. and things have gone well. But there's been many downs, I'm sure, in, yeah, yeah. in your career as everyone. What... what <laughs> are some of the, the, the downs you've had and what got you through them? Well, my amazing business partner, Trish, for one, because... She you know, re relate, you were a yeah, related... We're, we're, we're cousins, cousin, but we're yeah. also, you know, we went into Rockpool together and, you know, I've, I've always seen to... I like to work to open restaurants around uh, natural or, or man-made disasters. So, <laughs> in, in 1989, we opened Rockpool in the recession that we had to have, yeah. and we had 18% interest rates. We wow. borrowed 1.8 million and paid 360,000 in interest the first year. So when anyone says interest rates are high now, they've got no idea. <laughs> and, uh, and then I opened a Bar and Grill in, and Spice Temple in Sydney. That was an $11 million project in the middle of the GFC. So that was yeah. perfect timing. Perfect timing, yeah, great. And then the day I was about to open Margaret with Samantha, my wife and the family and everybody, uh, yeah, we got closed down for the second shutdown in COVID for four and a half months. So what it basically says, though, that if you're focused and you concentrate and you've got a really good business plan, everything goes in cycles. If you think it's bad today, it will get better tomorrow. You know, we haven't been in a recession since 1989. Where we have really didn't even dip into one during COVID, uh, during all the sorts of various things that happened during the GFC. We've been very lucky in Australia, but we do cycle. The economy softens a little bit, and then you get through that, and you get a lot of payback on the other side if you can stay in business. So for me, it's always, you know, focus on the here and the now and getting to the to the you know the future because the future will always um, improve. So, so I mean, what drives you? What keeps you going? I mean, some of these kids are thinking of quitting their apprenticeships and, and, and uh, walking away and looking at another profession yeah, that's perhaps yeah. less hours and more money. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that, you know, that's, that's personal choices. You have to love what you do. I mean, I always think people who are really successful in, in hospitality, 
get that it's a lifestyle. So basically 24 hours a day, you're working it, you're sleeping it, you're eating it, you're dreaming it. That's essentially what happens. You know, but for me, I, I actually used to be a, a pretty good rugby player. I played at school, representative football and stuff. But for me, I used to think about being the captain of the Wallabies. I wasn't even happy with just being a Wallaby. I didn't really, really <laughs> realise it. But I actually really like to lead people. So I think if you have that natural inclination to take people on a journey with you, communicate with them really well, give them a philosophy that they can believe in, and, and you can have like-minded and shared um, vision of where you want to go, you know, it can be an incredible industry to work in. But you want to work for somebody who will inspire you and take you on uh, you know, a, a, a ride with you. It's, it's really important they give you the tools for you to get where you want to go. And that could be being, you know, being a head chef at my restaurant, uh, working there for three or four years and going on opening your own restaurant or going and opening an, you know, another restaurant that's bigger than the one that we've just been in. To have aspiration is really awesome. Or it could be to be incredibly satisfied to, to be in the space that you're in because you get a lot of joy out of it. But if you don't get joy out of it, it's really hard to stay in the industry because it is antisocial. There are lots of different things going on in it. But when you lock into it, it's fantastic. I mean, you know, for our family, our restaurants open Wednesday to Sunday because of where we are now. Most of my life I had restaurants in the business CBD, so didn't open on Sunday until we went down to Melbourne and opened um, down, down Bar and Grill and Spice Temple and Rosetta down there. And then had to keep working Sundays again. And now I work pretty much every Sunday. But because I love it, it's not a hassle for me whatsoever. And I think the important thing is Probably took me 47 years in the restaurant business to learn this and I was running around building kind of empires and I was lucky enough to be able to sell, uh, sell it to really fund the rest of my life. But what's really awesome is I love being in Double Bay now. For me, going into the bakery at 7.30 in the morning, chatting to people who are getting coffee, going in and talking to Will the baker about how good the bake was today, or sometimes there's some failures. It's a very you know, organic, natural product. And, uh, and then moving through to working with the guys, fish coming in at Margaret, then going on to customers coming in and then cooking for them. And I've probably doing more cooking now than I have, uh, you know, for the last four or five years before COVID came. And in all that, I'm just so happy that I now tell people that if I leave Double Bay, I only, I'm going to on holidays. <laughs> people keep ringing me, I'd love to do Margaret here, I'd love to do this. Like, guys, no. It took me all this time to figure it out. It, it, it's a good question, but firstly, who, um, how did you get that sort of leadership management style? Do, is that something that was taught along the way, or you just felt I think, you had I it? Think, I think my, my parents just taught me to be, um, I mean, c confident in a, in a way with myself, but also understanding, uh, you know, my dad ran his own business, my mum did it at some stage. Uh, you know, at home was a reasonably large kind of Brady Bunch family. They, they bought a bunch together and I was the kind of only one that was related to all of them. And all of that kind of made you independent, think for yourself, work, work really hard. And so when I, when I was a waiter, went travelling, and then I came back, I went into a junior management role and then by the time I was 19 I was running sales. I've got a, my, my beautiful daughter who's 19, she said to me the other day, I'm working in the restaurant, I'm really, she's actually really good. She's got natural hospitality, actually. It's a beautiful gift, and she um, is, has got an incredible propensity to work. She's doing, like, uni, juggling a boyfriend, working really hard, doing all this stuff. But I said to her, but I was managing a restaurant at 19. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Where do you see the future of uh, Australian food and, and, and things like that going now? I just think it's getting better and better. I think... Um, well, you've been the, a big part of that. You, you deal with your suppliers and you, yeah. you push them. So well, that's I mean, we've, we've put thousands of people out of originally Rockpool and Bar and Grill and all of these various restaurants, which is great, and hopefully we teach them good hospitality. People walk away with a strong philosophy. We talk about the care philosophy, so that's, that's an important part of what we do. And it, it's interesting. I've, I start by telling my staff that we're, we're not in the restaurant business. We're in the business of creating memories. We're in the nostalgia business. Everybody eats, they have an experience, it's gone. They walk out, the one thing they hold is a memory and it's very, very important that you create these memories for the people who come to you. So one of the, one of the things that I found interesting, which was like a, a proof in the pudding of what I'd been talking about all those years is in 2002 when Scott rang me up and said, hey, there's this top 50 restaurant in the world thing, what is that? So they'd asked 
I said, I don't know anything about it because it only just started, but, it, but they basically asked 500 people around the world their favourite five restaurant experiences and, you know, Rockpool popped up at number four. So clearly we've been creating a lot of great memories along the way. But I just think the, the business is getting stronger, it's getting more professional, there's more money being spent on infrastructure. I mean, the amount of money now being spent in restaurants uh, is extraordinary. I'm just building Songbird and a, a yeah, Bobby. Yeah, you, you double bay as well. So. Yeah, it's about yeah. a thousand square metres over four levels and the build cost has come in at like 10 million. So you wouldn't even think about spending that you know, 20 years ago. But there's just, there's just incredible kitchens, beautiful places to work, really great people. Lots of Australians have travelled and worked overseas. Lots are coming back and, and inspiring. Uh, and, you know, then, then there's the whole... The, growing, fishing, everything's getting better and better and it's becoming more and more mainstream, which is great. Lots of fantastic farmers that you can deal with, lots of great fishermen. And importantly, I think if you want to, and it goes back to what Danielle was saying, what Luke's probably said before, because he went through the same process, you, you choose a couple of places that you think you really like to work. You like the food, you like the philosophy, you've read about the thing, and then probably you don't have to write a letter anymore, you write an email, <laughs> And you keep reminding them because in Danielle's case, it can, it's happened. And I know it happens in our restaurants and has. Sometimes, you know, if you're persistent, but also if you're the right moment, right time, yours comes in, somebody's just resigned, oh, let's get Danielle in and talk to her. You know, and that's, that's what happens in restaurants. So if you want a career and you want to be really good at it, you've got to work with the best people. So you, you think about where that is and you start hassling them until they finally give you a job. Yeah. Um, lastly, you, you've won many awards. You've got an Order of Australia. You do heaps for charity. I don't know where you get the time and the energy <laughs> with all your business to do that, well, which, you, which, which is incredible. But, and you've got all, you've had chef's hats and best restaurants of the year. How important are those sort of things for, for young people to strive for, the chef's hats and winning yeah. restaurant of the year? Is that important? Look, it's not the be-all and end-all. And um, when some of my friends who've lost hats and things have happened to them, I've actually rung them and spoken to them and said, look, you know, you, the important thing for everyone to remember is you're probably doing the same thing today as you're going to do tomorrow and as you were yesterday. Mm. It's just, you know, reviewers change or a moment happens. We are not fabulously great every moment of the day. We have failures, we have humans in the restaurant. So as long as we've got customers that are human and, and, and staff that are human, we're gonna have interactions that may or may not work properly. But for me, it's really you know all about making sure that you get motivated by those things. So it's wonderful for your staff. They're working really, really hard for you and you get three hats or you get restaurant of the year or you get best new restaurant. It's really motivating for all the people who work for you because they see the combination of all their hard work. Everybody's working hard, everybody's focused, everybody's putting in 110% effort. And for them to be able to say, wow, I work in this restaurant is really rewarding. The most important thing about any kind of motivation or any kind of you know, enjoyment of a job is job satisfaction, right? If you, you can have what you think is the best job in the world and they can pay you millions but if you hate every moment of it then it, it, it's just not a great life choice like life's about being happy about being balanced about getting all of those things in life that that you know it's, it's pretty fleeting you know there's a lot of great memes going around now about like when you're 20 and when you're 30 and when you're 40 and when you're like me 60 but you know life's super short so you really have to get in there find something you really love doing find people that you really love being friends with, cultivate that and, and you know, think about happiness because it's a really shit place to be if you're not happy. Fantastic. Um, I think we've got a few questions from some students. Here we go, go for from it. the front row. Front row. Hello, I'm Muley. I'm studying uh, set four on kitchen management. And my question for you today is, um, what tips would you give um, chefs on how to work efficiently? Sure, well I think you know the most important thing is you want to kind of fill your life with, with, with food. So, so eating out is really important. Um, reading is really important. Read absolutely every great cookbook you possibly can and everything you can about food to give you a broader knowledge of what's going on in the industry. And then importantly work in your own space like really efficiently. Um, think about you know mise en place being organised 
using great produce, you know, making sure you've got the skills to be able to utilise it and things. And then one of the things that we talk about in the care philosophy a lot is caring for each other. So making sure that when you're working in a restaurant that you are concerned about the person working next to you and the person working in front of you. And that really creates great teamwork if everybody's working together and thinking about each other. So it's, it's, it's not just about knife skills, it's not just about cooking, it's about being in the right headspace to make sure that you can focus on that, but you can take other people along with you. So, so you know, are you okay is really important. You know, are you okay on the mise en place? Can I help you? Uh, you know, can I help you do one little thing in service that would make it life easier? Can I help a waiter do something that's going to make him look after the customers um, better and, and, and easier? And so, and most importantly, if you know that somebody's either not well, so they need to go home and to be looked after and to check up on, or most importantly, if anyone's having a bad day or a bad mental health day, that you're there to support and ask them. So you have to think about your life in terms of not just what you're doing as a chef, a cook, whatever it might be, a waiter, whatever you are in that restaurant, but you're part of a community of people working together. And I think the most important thing about my restaurants is that we all try to look after each other. You know, family meals are a very important part of sitting down. I always make sure it's great food, not anything that's left over. I always make sure that we're all, always talking to people if they, if we feel they're having problems at home or they're having problems with other other guys in the in the kitchen or on the floor, whatever, we sit down and try and resolve those issues because all of that stuff makes it more efficient to do the things that you do every day. Wonderful. Uh, I think we've got one, two more questions. <coughs> That's okay. Um, hi, Neil. My name is Sally Ben. I'm Sally. currently studying Certificate 3 in Commercial Cookery. Um, I would like to ask how do you adjust in financially challenging times and when do you decide it is time to tap out? <laughs> also, hashtag winning is, twin, uh, twinning is winning. <laughs> Well, I haven't tapped out yet, so <laughs> <laughs> don't know when, I, I don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, look, I think most importantly as a business owner, and I know that my business partner Trish and I sat in 2000 just before the Olympics and thought, like, you know, we'd been in Darling Harbour, that was a disaster, a couple of other things that we did. And, and we sat there and said, uh, you know, I think we're going to have to, you know, fold this um, knowing before, very importantly, before we hurt the people that we really care about, you know, staff entitlements, our suppliers, people that we just would not because of how important they are to us, we, we would not let down. And, and uh, you know, Sam was part of this, she was very happy for us, you know, we sold our house, Trish, Trish sold hers, uh, apartment, sorry, Trish sold her house, we put some more money into the bank, we got rolling, and very luckily the Olympics came along. I'm just one of these people that seem to get, get really lucked out by things, but we had Darling Harbour, we had the American Express Foundation Hall and Level 6 at the MCA, which we, we did a ACO catering, and, and then we did Rockpool, which you just couldn't get into. I mean, we took money like you just wouldn't. And, and it was interesting, because at that time, n almost nothing uh, really worked apart from places in the city places in the suburbs weren't doing any more business or even less actually because the Olympics were on. They're totally opposite now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we actually made a million dollars in that two weeks, which is extraordinary and that really kept us going. But what is really important is it's impossible to run a really good business when, when the bad time comes. You can't go, oh gee, I better start really caring about the customers now. You have to set the tone for the minute you open that place so that when the bad times come, people go, Okay, where's value? Oh, you know what? I go if I spend this money at Margaret, I'm going to have a fantastic time that I can remember and hold on to, and it's a great experience. And so I'll keep spending some money there, but I won't spend there and I won't spend there. So you have to get ready for the hard times when the good times are there. You have to look after your customers. The best marketing happens in your restaurant. Spend that extra percent on your customers. You know, it's a matter of like regular customer, that glass of champagne, the dessert, looking after somebody, comping something if it's really, you know, a right, the right moment to do it. Like, make sure that your marketing spend goes back into your customers and I promise you, you'll have a restaurant that thrives. Brilliant. We have one more question. Hey there, Neil. My name's Mitchell Kilday and I'm uh, studying my Certificate 3 in Commercial Cookery. I was just wondering, how do you stay ahead of the trends and evolve in the hospitality like business? Uh, I don't really do, do that. I just, I just do things for like the way I like to cook. I mean, I, I honestly, 
don't cook for customers. I actually cook the food that I really love. And people say to me, like Margaret menu's got like 70 items on it. People say to me, what's, what's your favorite dish? And I honestly can't say what my favorite dish is because I love them all. So I'm just really lucky that the way I like to eat, customers like to eat. So I kind of, kind of cook in a style. And it's interesting, it was Sam and my 20th, uh, 20th First, sorry. Gee, you nearly got that wrong, didn't you? <laughs> 20, 21st wedding anniversary on Saturday. Congratulations. And thank you. And she showed me the menu. My very good friend Guillaume had been along then and he gave it to me because he was closed on Sunday. And I took all my staff over and did our wedding, which was awesome because the food was the food I love to eat, which is brilliant, made by my guys. And, and all of the wine growers around Australia, the, the wineries in Australia really looked after us and we had amazing wine. And we got married and it was a beautiful sunny day right, right there uh, on the Opera House with the, with the Harbour Bridge in it. And then we went in and had this incredible lunch. And then finally, at about 7 o'clock, Craig, who was the venue manager, said at 7 o'clock in the evening from 10.30 in the morning, went, do you think you guys could leave? Because no one's going to go if you don't. Anyway, that's an aside. Why I say that is I was looking at the menu, Sam showed it to me, and every single course is really still dishes that I do today maybe with some twist. more modernization or twist, yeah. but my, my, my cooking style has never really changed that much. And so, I don't know, for me it's about sourcing the best ingredients and really letting those speak. I, I just do not like kind of layering things up too much to where sometimes they're really delicious, but you wouldn't really know what you're eating. Um, so yeah, cook, cook what you love, and, and I'm sure that people will enjoy it. Neil, do we have time for one more? For yeah, one of students? course. Well, I believe there's one more question. Uh, hi, I'm Emlyn Bilby. I'm doing a certificate three in commercial cookery. Yep. Um, and I was just wondering at what point in your career you realized you had what it takes to get to the top of the culinary world. <laughs> um, <laughs> so look, still trying to work it out? <laughs> <laughs> when I was about 20, eight or 30, I kind of thought I you know, was pretty good and knew everything and now then I'm, nearly 67, I kind of realised you'll never know everything and, and I'm so happy in the position that, that I'm in. But look, it was, it's like what I said when I kind of dreamt about being the captain of the Wallabies. I've always kind of thought about it myself as kind of leading and inspiring and working with people. And so when I opened um, Blue Water Grill, it was pretty amazing and all the things that have been said about about uh, you know Baron Joey House when I was there. But I do think probably the, the start of you know me kind of really crystallizing who I am and what I do was really opening Rockpool in 89. So I guess, you know, 80, 89 would, would have been at 32 that I really felt like I was kind of kicking some serious goals. Wow. Well, there you have it. Neil Perry, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure, mate. Thank you.